else's end. Give me okay? All right. Uh, okay, so what does it take to simulate orbits? Uh, before we can actually do that, we're gonna need a couple of things. So the first thing that we're gonna need is a complete model of space. And after that, we're gonna need a dynamic rule to update the state of the bodies that are in our space. Uh, and those two things together should be sufficient for uh, simulating an orbit, or at least getting something that kind of looks orbity. So the first uh, complete model of space ever compiled was put together by Euclid uh, over 2,000 years ago, and it's still good today. It was good enough to get uh, the Apollo mission to the moon, so we're gonna study that. And it consists of uh, five axioms and a collection of definitions, but I'm just gonna cover the axioms here. So the first axiom says that between any two points, A and B, a line segment L can be drawn. And axiom two states that and given any line segment, you can extend that line segment indefinitely in a new, and just get a larger line segment that contains the original one. Uh, the third is that a circle can be drawn at any point uh, with any radius. Uh, fourth is that all right angles are congruent, uh, which is a way, it's like an equivalence relation. So given any two right angles, uh, you can always line them up in this way. And finally, this one is the point of divergence from more modern theories of space. It's uh, sometimes called the parallel postulate. It states that given any line and a point not on that line, there's exactly one other line that runs through it that doesn't intersect the original line. Uh, and that is actually, that's what we're gonna take as the definition of parallel. Um, and that's a very special property and, and we'll be using it later. Uh, and so using these almost trivial collection of five axioms, we can actually derive some pretty useful stuff. And the thing that we'll be using here, you probably recognize from uh, high school, this is uh, just the Pythagorean theorem. The relevance for the problem of um, simulating planets or simulating orbits is mainly the way to calculate distance. So you can imagine we have a body here like the sun, a body here like the earth, and we have some coordinate system that we're gonna use to get these numbers A and B and then using this formula here, we can figure out the distance between them. Uh, and that'll be useful for figuring out the force between them. Uh, so, we're gonna be using vectors, and vectors are just directed line segments. And they also have this ability to be scaled by a real number. So we can take some vector V, and then we can scale it just by multiplying by a real number. And uh, you can see the connection between the first and two axioms uh, right away. And for some terminology, we're just gonna call that uh, the arrowhead part, we're gonna call that the head of the vector, and then the other end is the tail. So you can kind of think of a vector as representing a displacement from the tail to the head. So vectors are really useful because they can be added together. And the operation, we're gonna start by de defining it geometrically. Uh, so given any two vectors where the uh, tail of the vector is the same, we can always, we can add these two vectors together. Um, and the way that we add them is, we pick one of the vectors and go from the tail up to its head, and then travel along another vector that's parallel to the other vector. And if you, if you see it geometrically, um, if you go along the, the other vector and then travel along a vector parallel to this vector, um, you get the same point. So that's another way of saying that it's commutative operation. So V plus Y is equal to or V plus W is W plus V. Um, and this, this will come up later when we try to work with forces because we're gonna be adding these things together in order to get the total force acting on the object. And vectors aren't really that useful when you just consider them geometrically. We, what we really want is to be able to actually do calculations on them and ultimately put it in a computer. So a computer doesn't really work in geometry, it works in numbers and arrays and all those nice things. So the way that we go from getting a, this geometric arrow right here to a, uh, something that we can compute with is by choosing a coordinate system. So we can uh, pick any three axes arbitrarily. We just have to require that the axes are perpendicular. So we just take these three lines that are all mutually perpendicular, and once we choose that and we choose a unit, then we can uh, count along each of these three axes uh, and write down the number of units that this vector goes out in this direction, and the number of units it goes out in this direction, and then this direction. And this way we have a triple of uh, numbers, or 
in two-dimensional space, we'd have a pair. Uh, so that's the connection between all this geometry and the code that'll come up. And a few more things about vectors that will really come in handy, and it's really just rooted all in that Euclidean geometry that we did earlier. Um, when we take these vectors here, if we, if we define this product on the, um, the array representation or that, that uh, triple of number representation of vectors, this, this thing that we call the dot product is just, uh, you take the x component, multiply those numbers together, you take the y component, you multiply those together, and then you take the z component and multiply those together and sum it all up. Uh, <clears throat> this operation turns out to tell you something about the length of the two vectors and the angle between them. So if we take a simple case of this where you just take a vector and then dot it with itself, notice that that would be v1 squared plus v2 squared plus v3 squared, which it's, once you see that, you can kind of see how that's related to the length because uh, that's like the a squared plus b squared in that Euclid, um, in the Pythagorean theorem that we saw earlier. So if we want to find out the length of a vector, all we have to do is dot it with itself and then square root it. Uh, and that's, so, so uh, we can represent the positions by vectors, uh, the positions of the bodies that we're trying to simulate. And if we want to find the distance between them, we just take the, the difference. So the way we'd implement this using all the stuff that we defined up until now is we'd multiply w by uh, the scalar minus one and then add them together. And that'll give you a vector that goes from this point to that point or from that point to this point, depending on whether it's v minus w or w minus v. And then if you take that, this uh, hypotenuse vector between the two points, if you just dot that with itself, then that'll give you the distance between those two points. So that's uh, what we'll use in the simulation. So now that we have kind of the first abstraction that um, we'll be working with, uh, we can write some code. So we'll just, uh, we'll have a wrapper class uh, called vector. It'll have an array of components. Um, and when we initialize, that's really all there is to it. Next, this is the more interesting part, we'll be implementing the algebra on it. So we want the addition and the, mul the scalar multiplication <laughs> operation. So when we add vectors together, it turns out that that uh, parallelogram law that we saw, we can implement that just by, once we have the vector in component form, we can just add the x components together and the y components together and the, y, the z components together. So we can do this using the awesome zip uh, method. And what that would do is zip, if you're not familiar, will just take two arrays that are the same length and it'll produce a new array where each element is pairs. So like if you had, say, a, b, c dot r zipped with uh, x, y, z, the result would be a comma uh, x, and then the second element would be b comma y, and then the third element would be c comma z. So, um, and then summing those together, that'll give you a single new vector, which is just a representation of the sum. And scalar multiplication is easy. We just uh, multiply the scalar that we pass in by the component numbers themselves. And then on top of that, we also want to check whether two vectors are equal. And most importantly, we want to be able to dot vectors. So uh, we, again, zip them together and then multi uh, multiply the components and then just sum them up. So that'll give us a way, given a vector and another vector, we can pass it in, get the dot product, and then do some science with that. So now, we have a model of space, but next we have to go on to the dynamic rule. This is where it gets a little bit more complicated, but um, also more interesting. And we can represent bodies in space. Uh, we can figure out the distances and, and represent the state of a system at a moment in time. But if we, what we really like to be able to do is play that forward in time and actually see how things would play out. So uh, we'll have to talk a little bit about uh, velocity and acceleration. So you could think about uh, the thing that we want to, given a body, we want to uh, simulate a path. So that you can think about as a sequence of vectors. And for each uh, vector at each moment in time, we can kind of organize that all together with this function x of t. So that x right here, this little arrow over the top means it's a vector, and that's the position at time t. So uh, given any 
function right here that, that tells you the position of a body at a certain point in time, we can easily calculate the velocity. And it, if, if you haven't taken calculus, this is basically just saying the, uh, the displacement in x divided by the displacement in time. So you can think about it as if you took some small amount of time in the future, you'd, you'd get a small displacement that would represent its movement. You take that and then scale it by one over the, the time, and that would give you the velocity vector. So uh, there's a similar relation between acceleration and velocity, and uh, using this, we'll be able to relate, what, I, I guess I'll, I'll wait. <laughs> so, uh, so this relation just says that the, the acceleration is the rate of change of velocity, velocity is the rate of change of position. Um, and if we don't have any acceleration at all, it actually turns out to be really simple. So Newton's very first law gives us a complete specification for that uh, position vector, or that position function because if there are no forces acting on a body, it just travels in a straight line. So if, if we imagine a, a state at one moment in time, we have some initial position, we have some initial velocity, and all we have to do is trace, have it trace out a line along that velocity vector because nothing's gonna change it. So this, this just traces out a, a straight line in space, and that's um, another way to understand Newton's first law. Now Newton's second law is the familiar F equals MA. Um, but I wrote this form a little bit more, kind of decompose the F because when you see F equals MA, that's easy to remember, but um, the problem is that you can't really do that much with it until you consider each of the individual forces. Like you can't, unless you just happen to know what the force is, um, just be, because you're lucky, um, you can't really do much with it. So. This is where the sum operation is kind of indispensable. We'll want to be able to calculate all of the forces that we can imagine. And uh, the way to imagine this is we're trying to figure the force on the ith object. So uh, you have some n objects or n bodies that you want to simulate. And for each one, you want to figure out the total force on it. Uh, so if i is ranging over from 1 to n, i is going to be uh, this, right, this number here is fixed for the sum, and then J represents that ranges over all the other bodies that are not I. So you're, you're literally taking the force between every single pair of bodies in the universe that you're simulating. And the way to calculate each of these individually is using Newton's law of universal gravitation, which uh, apocryphally involved an apple and... Um, Ultimately, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. It's, it's just a, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, we, can, we can just kind of take it and run with it, but it is, it is kind of worth trying to analyze why it has this form. Uh, I think you can ignore the gravitational uh, constant. In, in my code, I actually just set it to one, and it turns out that there's a lot of research papers that do that too, so I'm just, physicists do this all the time, so we can kind of ignore this term. Um, this right here, you can see, just to make sure the, the kind of the types work out, I guess, is that this is going to be a vector. This is the force from the body at position J on the body at position I. And down here, what you have is this little R vector with a hat. That just means that it's a, a vector with unit length. So this thing has length one. Um, so when you, basically, this is the scalar that you multiply by your vector. So it makes sense that the force would go from this object, or from this body towards that body, because that's what we're trying to figure out. Um, but this uh, distance, so this rij, that um, these vertical bars, if you haven't seen them before, they just mean the length of the vector. So this vector from position j to position i, that would be rij, uh, that vector right there, the length of it is what we're, div or we're dividing by the length squared. And the reason it's squared actually has to do with three-dimensional geometry. So if you, think about, uh, if you think about this as the center of a sphere, and then this, just imagine the length of that right there is r, then 
if you tried to take all of the points that were distance r away from point i, you'd get a sphere. In two dimensions, you'd get a circle, and um, that whole sphere you can kind of think about is there's, there's some amount of potential energy that is uh, uh, sort of spread out along the surface of that sphere, and as the sphere expands, that same amount of energy decreases uh, because you, you essentially have, by the conservation of energy, you have a, um, you know that as you get a larger and larger surface area, you're going to get a smaller amount of energy. And the surface area scales like the square of that radius. So uh, in, in one dimension, or in two dimensions, a circle scales like the radius itself. It's like one over r. Um, so, or the, the circle, two pi r would give you the circumference. And uh, as you expand, since it's expanding proportional to r, the total amount that's spread out over that circle decreases proportional to 1 over r. So in, in three dimensions, it would decrease proportional to 1 over r squared. Uh, so this, this number really here has to, this reflects the fact that we're measuring these things in, in a three-dimensional space. Um, and this is also something that Newton figured out just by looking at a whole bunch of astronomical observations and um, kind of working, using a little geometry, and then turns out this works out really well. And uh, there's, there's a strong geometrical reason for this. So, uh, more code. So we want to represent bodies, uh, and they have, the relevant data is the mass, the position, and the velocity. So this initialize right here, this is gonna, this is where you plug in the initial conditions, and then um, we'll, we'll update this state as time progresses. Um, and just, just a note about bodies, the uh, Newton's laws don't care about radius or shapes, it's, uh, it, it doesn't, doesn't care. All that matters is the total mass and the center of mass. Uh, so a way to think about that is if you, were to, if you were to take the sun and just collapse it down into a black hole, just somehow, uh, without changing its mass, without changing its center of mass, all of the Earth's orbits and Mars' orbits and everything would travel around as if nothing had changed other than light. So, um, so in, our, in our simulation, we don't actually need some notion of the shape of the body. We just, we can imagine it's equivalent to a bunch of little black holes where all of the mass is collapsed to a single point and their motion, their path through space is going to be the same. Uh, and it could be, yeah, it doesn't even have to be a sphere. It could be a hot dog. <laughs> um, just as long as, like, if you were to take this hot dog and then squish it down into a sphere, um, and then center of mass of the hot dog, uh, it would travel along the same path as that meatball. <laughs> so this is where we actually implement uh, Newton's law of universal gravitation. Um, and the, the way that we'll do it here is we'll have something that'll take a body, so say it's body I, and we'll pass in body J, and we want to figure out the force from the body that we passed in on self. Uh, so first thing we want to do is take that, uh, remember the U and V diagram? Uh, this right here, we're just calculating that, that vector from V to U. Um, here we're calculating the, the norm, which is like the, the length of the vector, so that'll be that R. Uh, R hat is that little length one vector from body J to body I. And then finally, we'll just plug it in the formula. And that will, so we take the unit vector and then this big scalar right here. And that right there is the total for, or that's the force component from body on self. Next, we move on to the universe, which uh, a wise man once said is very, very big. It's, I can't emphasize this enough, it's really, really, really big. It's difficult to even imagine. Uh, we'll represent the universe in Ruby, um, and it's going to just have some number of dimensions and bodies. And really, we want the number of dimensions because we don't add a three-dimensional vector to a two-dimensional vector because that's not defined. Um, and the bodies themselves, we're going to kind of identify the time within the computer with the time in the simulation. So one second in computer time represents one second in the simulator time. So 
we'll just be updating all of the body's states in place. So all the bodies will just be these objects, and their internal state's going to be updated by the universe. So the body doesn't really know about all the different bodies in the, the universe. The universe tells each body about the other bodies. Um, and it'll be useful since we're taking all the, we're, we're going to calculate each unique pair of bodies in the universe and, and work out the force for each one. And we'll only be considering different bodies. Uh, so this, this iterator will be useful. For, so for each of these pairs, we'll be calculating the, uh, the force. And the first thing we'll do is initialize a whole bunch of zero vectors. And each of those n zero vectors are going to be the force on the ith object. Um, actually, let's go back. Let's just kind of like break this down a little bit. So for each pair, we want to make sure that we sum up the force from body j on body i. Just add them all up. That'll give you the left side of the f equals ma equation. And this right here is where we'll use those forces to update the position. But we can't just do that directly. We'll, we'll have to go kind of from force to acceleration. So it's f equals ma. That means that a is equal to f over m. So now that we have this acceleration, that's just the force divided by the mass. Uh, we also want to figure out the velocity. So the velocity right here, since the velocity is the rate of change of the acceleration, or um, it's the other way around. Acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. And uh, that means that acceleration is in meters per second squared. So in order to make the units work out, we want to multiply by some time, so we'll have meters per second. That'll give you a, a velocity. And position, since the velocity is the rate of change of position, we'll do the same thing where we have meters per second, but we want a meter, something in, in meter units. So we'll multiply again by the, the time interval, dt. Um, and then that will give you the, we're, we're going to be adding it, so that'll be the displacement in position after dt seconds. Um, and in the simulator, I used uh, milliseconds. Uh, but it just has to be a sufficiently small time step right there. So all of this calculation is going to be going on in Ruby. Um, and I, I don't really know any graphical libraries for Ruby. And I, um, I figured it would be kind of interesting to try to stream it to a browser and do it in a canvas. So, uh, so I wrote this little server. And then, um, and then also a, a WebSocket server because I didn't actually write the WebSocket server because uh, that's hard. I tried and failed miserably. <laughs> Um, it's just there's, there's a lot of bit masking, and you really have to understand the protocol. So for now, I, I found this great tool, um, WebSocket D, which uh, it, it takes standard out and then maps it to a WebSocket server. And it also takes anything that comes into the WebSocket server and maps it to standard in. So you can just write plain Ruby and then work with uh, standard input and standard output, and then just pipe it to Web so uh, WebSocket D. So that was, that was a lot of, that was a relief. <laughs> Uh, so, since we're going to be running both a web server and a WebSocket server, um, it's, it gets kind of tricky. So, uh, we need to fork the web server into the background and then um, shell out to WebSocket D, since it's actually a, it's just a separate command line tool. So, this uh, this server right here, this is just WebRIC. Uh, I did this because I didn't want to pull in too too many dependencies, um, and then this will. Uh, this will kill the background process if uh, it gets an interrupt, like a control C or something. Uh, and then we also want to mount slash so that we can visit in the browser. Um, and so these examples right here, these are some uh, simulators that I wrote using all that Ruby code. And uh, we'll actually see this running. Uh, that's, that's the fun part coming up. Uh, yeah, so the first application is going to be a binary star system. So that's just where we'll have two bodies. We'll assume that their masses are equal and that they're moving in such a way that they're traveling around in a circle. Uh, so this velocity is just going to be the negative of that. And that, uh, that very kind of predictable motion in advance is just called um, uniform circular motion. <laughs> 
And that's a really kind of special type of motion. That's where you have a perfect circle and you have this quantity called the centripetal acceleration. Sometimes you hear centripetal, um, but it, it means center seeking. Uh, and the reason it's pointed inward, you can kind of imagine it's got some tangential velocity and it's about to fly off into space. But if it's moving in a circle, there's something pulling it towards the center of the circle. So that's what this a vector is. And we know that the length of that a is just uh, equal to v squared over r, which I just, uh, you, you just look it up in a book. Uh, there's a way to figure this out by deriving it, but this is kind of, uh, this you might see in like a freshman physics class. Um, and it's just something that, that'll be, we can use to figure out the initial velocity. Because we've, we've already know the masses, the two masses are gonna be equal. We can put them in some configuration where they're some distance apart. But if we didn't get the velocities right, they would either fall into each other or they would fly off into space. So we wanna make sure that we get the velocities just right so that they travel around in a circle. Uh, so now that we have that A, we can just plug in uh, the Newton's universal law of gravitation and then um, do some more algebraic messing around and then finally get that uh, velocity right there. Uh, Coming up. <laughs> well, slow down. <sighs> Kill me. <laughs> Seriously? Seriously. <laughs> All right, this this actually worked. Uh <laughs> I'm just gonna keep going. Uh, anyway. I think that's the, just the WebSocket server though. Cause yeah, the, yeah, so the, we could live debug this. I, I got a few more minutes. <laughs> Let's do it, all right. So it looks like we have an error here. Uh, it's true. Yeah, so I have a couple cool initial conditions in here, and I'll go over some of the more uh, advanced ones if we have time and if this actually gets working. Um, but it's, uh, the thing that you can expect is just two bodies that are traveling around in a circle around some common center of mass. Uh, anybody have any questions? Is that I gloss over anything? <laughs> I, I built it locally, actually. Um, yeah, it's embarrassing. Frame rate. Oh, that's a good question. So um, I used a request animation frame in the browser. So. Essentially, the WebSocket server streams a whole bunch of data to the browser, and it updates the current state, and it's just in a global variable. And uh, I use a request animation frame so that whenever the browser is ready to render something, it will then run whatever the, it'll render whatever the current state is. So it'll render as fast as it can, and it's also nice because if you're away from the tab, um, it will uh, it won't actually render anything. So one, one, one sec, because <laughs> this is actually pretty cool. All right, I'm not, I'm not gonna wake you guys, make everyone here wait. So um, this, this is actually on GitHub right now. Um, I had it running at uh, Rails PDX in uh, Portland. Um, 
but uh, but yeah, so that's that's something that we can run later and, and you can all check out. Uh, where are the slides? That could be. Oh, uh, you know what? That's probably it. Yes, that is localhost. That's right. Oh, this is good. That was actually really great. <laughs> this is like not pair programming, but like uh, end body programming. <laughs> so is that so? That's the issue. Is the the WebSocket server there? Yeah. Yeah, that's probably the problem. Yeah. And then in WebJS. So it is localhost. <laughs> yes. All right, so server B, client, client address, 's yeah I'm looking yeah there it is thank you Oh, there it is, right there. <laughs> Thank you. What's that? Binary orbits by pair programming. There we go. Okay, cool. There we go. Awesome. Thank you. That was intense. <laughs> all right. <laughs> uh, yeah. No. Thank you all. That was that was really great. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so with only two bodies, it turns out to be really easy to solve in general. Like you can even, you don't even have to run a numerical simulation like that. You can actually solve it analytically so that you know for all time uh, the whole path of the body. Uh, it's, um, it turns out to be really, really simple. But just by adding a third body to your universe, uh, it, it turns out to be, in general, impossible to solve. Um, and uh, the, more, the more bodies you add, the, uh, the more rounding error and other things can kind of cause your simulation to diverge from uh, what would have actually happened in nature. Um, but it's been studied for a really, really long time, so there's, there's some examples that, that have a really nice symmetry to them, and uh, those are instructive to study. Uh, they have to be really, really, really highly symmetrical, and they're, very, they're kind of brittle. They're rarely observed in nature because they um, just, as soon as you have more than three bodies, you get, you easily get chaos. Um, and you might get stable orbits for a few billion years, but I mean, when you think about infinity, it, it's uh, even something that seems stable, like our own 
uh, solar system can be really, uh, can, can have chaotic tendencies at times. Uh, so this, this great paper right here, uh, which is only about 15 years old, uh, this, find, this found a, an orbit, a three-body orbit that traces out a infinity shape, a uh, lemniscate, that's, that's what it's called. Uh, and the initial conditions, I just ripped them right out of the paper, and if you kind of look at them, you can see already there's some symmetry. So for the, the first body, it has this, it starts at some point right there. Um, and then you have another body right here at the zero point, and then this third body right here is uh, the negative of this first one. So this, this, this vector right here multiplied by negative one. Um, so already they're along a straight line at that one moment in time. And for the velocities, there's, uh, there's also a lot of symmetry. Here you have a tangent vector going off in this direction and it's the exact same velocity at that body right there. Um, and then this one down here is two times that vector, but times negative, or it's uh, in the opposite direction. So those initial conditions, so assuming the masses are all equal, assuming these positions and these initial velocities, this should move around in a uh, figure eight. Uh, yeah, so I, I have it already running, hopefully. Real quick check. So that was three body. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Call figure eight. Yeah, that works. There we go. So this is really cool because uh, you could watch this for a while. It's, uh, it's like juggling. <laughs> it's like planets juggling themselves. And um, it's, uh, it, it's mesmerizing. Uh, but this is also something that's, you, I, I looked around and I haven't found anything like this that astronomers observed because there are more than three bodies in the universe and that kind of makes things complicated because as, <laughs> as you saw the left, the left hand side of that equation had a sum of all, it's a sum over all bodies in the universe. So as long as you have more than three, you're always gonna get small perturbations that are gonna fling things off in, in other directions. And this is just something that um, is just, uh, it's too brittle. Um, and some random initial conditions are, are also kind of fun to watch. Um, these, again, if you notice, there's no, there's no collision detection because they, they all kind of are simulated as if uh, all of the mass is concentrated at a single infinitesimal point. Um, but the random initial conditions are a little bit more realistic because that's kind of how stuff works out in the universe. Things scatter around. Some orbits that are stable remain. Most of them just get flung off into space. And uh, yeah, so it's, there's some random initial conditions, those are fun. And uh, yeah, so after Newton, so even though New Newtonian mechanics were, work really well, um, physics has kind of branched off in two directions. We have uh, special and general relativity, and then we also have quantum mechanics, which deals with electromagnetism and everything other than uh, gravity. And uh, if we imagine physics is kind of a git repository. Newtonian physics right here is the initial commit, and general relativity is one branch, and then quantum mechanics is another branch. <laughs> and as of yet, there, um, those, those branches have merge conflicts that nobody's been able to work out, so. <laughs> Thank you. So that's, uh, that's it. We don't know what's gonna come next, but uh, it's, all of these are possibilities. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for the debugging. Thank you for everything.